This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Carly, and I are talking about getting the emotional pull on your reader that you are striving for when you craft your scenes. I've been I've been seeing writers struggling with this in the manuscripts I'm currently editing and coaching on. And I know for me as a writer, I can be so focused on the crafting part that I don't feel what I am trying to evoke in my reader through this crafting process. It's like I'm a step or two removed. You know, I'm on the wrong side of the prose to actually feel it myself. So um, is this something you struggle with? And do you have any strategies that you use to help with this process? Uh, I have a good cry when I read my first draft and realize how crap it is. (laughs) (laughs) Not that kind of emotion, Robert. Oh, right, 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 right. right. (laughs) No, 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 the emotion you want to create. Oh, right, right. Oh, Uh, yeah. (laughs) In the the, reader. The reason I say that is because you, when you, when I, I've spoken about this before, when I write, stuff happens in my mind so fast that, the words on the page skip too many things and so there are giant leaps in, in emotional states that I only spot when in revision um, and, and I've learned to live with that I've learned to not agonize over word choice in first draft and, and so okay look I've used a really crappy verb there and, and I've just thrown in an adverb in to try and make it stronger whatever you know I'm just going to bash it out and and do the you know, on that one extreme of, you know, do the vomit draft. Um, and what I've often found is coming back to it, not just that I've used weak sentence construction, perhaps, which is, you know, at the granular level, but in the overall level, I've had characters react way too fast. Mm. Um, and, you know, emotions don't, I mean, somebody can be angered instantly, but they don't let go of it instantly. Um, and so I think some of that finessing for me comes with revisiting as you said Alita from the reader's point of view where you're digesting it as opposed to spewing it out perhaps to Mm -hmm. continue with my with my uh, (laughs) 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 intestinal metaphors (laughs) yeah I love that you said you sometimes have your characters react too fast Robert because I've noticed in some of the manuscripts I'm working on, that the writer might have all of the right elements in the scene, but they need to be reordered or restructured or spread out more, you know, and so you need to lay the emotional groundwork for the reader and you need to create a build or a simmer to then get that emotional payoff, not only in your character to give it the sort of oomph or punch that it needs to affect the reader, but also to get the reader um, thinking about this. Uh, quite a while ago, we did an episode on that TED talk from the Pixar uh, yes. artist, right? And he says, give two plus two, don't give four. And I think if we rush to the conclusion of the scene or to the emotional payoff, we're giving them four. Like, here's this point, here's this point, here's the reaction. And we need to get the reader processing to and pulling on that second two and the reader coming up with four, which is the emotional reaction, if that's not too messy of of an analogy there, right? But maybe part of our difficulty in evoking these feelings in our readers is that we're pushing the four instead of evolving the scene and giving the two plus two yeah exactly because it it, it gets confused i think uh, people tend to think you can only address this at the granular level of of, you know it's about writing the right sentences that suddenly did of that sucker punch Mm -hmm. but the reality is the sucker punch only comes from what's been built before um and uh you know like the it's the it's the straw that breaks the camel's back and and so i think to continue talking 
metaphors you know, I'll get, hopefully get to a concrete example soon <laughs> <laughs> the, the the idea that I think it's all driven by cognitive dissonance and is the cognitive dissonance so is the pull that you're talking about uh, leader is that appropriate to that particular scene or that particular sequence of scenes um, and th it needs to kind of match you know so that we're pulled towards the emotional response as opposed to being mm, given it by the writer right um, and so, yeah, at a granular level, you might say, well, that's show, don't tell. But it's sort of, it is and it isn't, because yeah. you could probably have a telling style, but if you set up the cognitive distance, okay, it would still work. It's, the reader would still feel the emotion. You could argue they might feel it better if it was written with more show than tell. But it's some of it is, I believe, down to the finesse of story structure itself. And as you say, doing the, now here's two, here's another two, now draw your conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, oh wow, it's four. You know, so the the as opposed to trying to deliver emotion, we have to build it. Right, yeah. right. The three of us were talking about Outlander, and you know, showing showing the nail going through um, what's his face's hand, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie's Jamie. hand. Thank you. <laughs> and I think. A mistake that a lot of writers make is thinking that if you show and don't tell, if you get that detail of the way the brow furrows or the eyes squeeze shut or the way the fingers curl or that descriptive element, that will make the reader feel. And sometimes that is it, but I think that's just one layer. And what we really need to get at is the subtext is... The meaning here so it's not about how well you describe the nail going in the hand it's about the fact that the reader knows he's enduring this pain because he loves and is protecting what's her face claire claire thank claire. you Carly. <laughs> i know i know oh sorry right and so a huge piece of our emotion a very emotional reaction to that scene is because it's really about his love and protection of Claire, not just about somebody having a nail put in their hand. Yes. Right. So yeah. what you're showing, yes, that physical showing has to be a huge piece of your craft, but really it's all the build up to that moment that, that, relationship the situation that got him into this position in the first place that's what's going to make us feel for that right. character and it's a word that gets used a lot on this podcast but i think it's right on and that important it's stakes what mm -hmm. are the stakes mm -hmm. you know if if he doesn't let his hand get pounded into the table with a nail by their captor then what right Bad, more bad things, different bad things. So it's, right. you know, the, the phrase that also I think we've said many times, which is like the better of two bad choices. Yes. You know what, or or the, to think of it different, uh, diff, uh, from the per, differently from the perspective of the writer, is what puts your what puts your hero in more hot water? What makes it even harder for your hero to resolve the moment, get out of it, compromise the hero's values? Um, I often, when when I'm thinking about this, emotion, when I'm thinking about emotional payoff and the way stakes, the stakes that a character is facing and the way stakes are raised, I often think of the TV show Friday Night Lights. Um, I really got attached to the, to the story and to the characters because it seemed like not so much that there were all these plot twists that I didn't see coming, but it just seemed like all the situations that these characters got into weren't that unpredictable, but then there would always be one more ratcheting up of the right. emotional stakes. Yeah. There would be one more thing that they had to face or one more kind of wrinkle to the thing that either they didn't see coming or we didn't fully realize until the moment was upon them. Um, but it was just taking it like that one half, that half twist a little farther. Um, I, think you get, I think you get a lot of emotional payoff from that as, uh, in your stories. Mm -hmm. that's a really nice observation i love that idea that you throw a character all the things that they can handle emotionally that that you know that the story is going to is is predictable that that's going to happen and then you throw them something that it's that just it's impossible for them to handle emotionally um 
and that can only come from what you set up for them as a character and and from a human psychology point of view emotion has got nothing to do with the senses we feel in the moment it's triggered it's yeah. it's from, from something in the past which we may or may not be even cognizant of so the more that that resonates with who your character is and and what they're dealing with and it could be a bombshell or it could be something subtle but it's an emotion is evoked by some something that's some feeling of or cluster of beliefs or a, as you said Carly a sense of value or something that you know that evokes some kind of feeling response in in their mind and body so it's a it's an unusual thing to have to describe actually mm -hmm. because you know you know we don't necessarily walk around our house and say you know the I'm feeling quite nervous and and you know my hands are all sweaty and um I'm just I can and my legs don't want to stop moving and no you go you know you walk out into the kitchen you go so what's up you know, you know it's just okay. it's there's there's the subtext of you know, emotion is such a subtext that then bringing it out and describing it risks spoiling it mhm mm mm -hmm. yeah yeah it does and that's such a great point to add to everything we've just said because if a writer relies on describing what the character is feeling that's you know unnatural right so then a next level of craft maybe a step up is describing the character's reaction to what he's feeling so maybe the hand jitters while he's pouring coffee or maybe he snaps at his wife and that's all you know a useful piece of the action but the way you make the reader care about the fact that he's nervous as you lay the groundwork of as Carly said what's at stake you know yep. why is he nervous why does it matter so much what is causing this anxiety is it because his wife is being threatened is it because he knows when he goes into work today he's going to get fired is it because Right. And so then we move from understanding cognitively what this character is feeling to empathizing with the character because we're part of this journey. If you're listening to this podcast, you are probably a writer and you've maybe heard me talk about the StoryWorks reading series. It is the new branch in the StoryWorks family tree. It is a literary journal podcast. That's right, a hybrid, a literary journal for your ears with a print anthology at the end of the year of the best of the podcast. I am open for submissions and I want to see your best prose right now. Get it to me before the holidays, people. I am taking both fiction and creative non fiction. You can read the guidelines and submit your work at storyworkspodcast.com slash submit. What are you waiting for? It's time to see your stories published and sit on the other side of this microphone from me. Have a conversation about your story craft. Right. So, yeah. So if you connect the emotions directly with the stakes, which I mean, we would probably unconsciously naturally want to do anyway but it's when they're mm -hmm. disconnected is is then when we read a book and we say you know i couldn't stand that character they were so whiny and mm -hmm. it's because their whininess made no sense to the story it just was something that the author had chosen as some way of characterization whereas if the whininess you could see was digging this character into a deeper hole that you know you, you felt for them and and yet they couldn't escape it, it, and because it it, uh, it went to the stakes, then that would make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. So it's emotion for, you know, don't put emotions in there for emotion's sake, just because right. you want to make people human. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. I think also, even if the situation that's happening in the story isn't relatable, like it's something that you have never experienced, you don't, it's not something you have to ex have experienced in your life, but it speaks, I think it must for, 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 um, emotional impact, it must speak to something that we've all experienced. Like, uh, let me give a concrete example. Um, I'm reading the book Circe right now, which is um, taking a particular character from the Odyssey and imagining 
part of that story from Cersei, from her perspective. Um, I'm very early in the book, so I can't give you a nice, you know, how this all works out. But I'm I'm feeling connected to this character, and things are starting to happen. And she's she's a god in in Greek mythology, or kind of uh, related to a god, uh, a demigod. And I have no experience as a demigod, but what I do have experience with where I relate to her is rejection. She's rejected several times early in the story in high stakes moments. And I feel that, right? You know, mm-hmm. as a human who has been rejected by other humans or other beings who I want, in her case, other beings she wants to, to feel connected with, and in one case, one she's fallen in love with, you know, I can relate to that. I can relate to that in my human experience. So rejection is one of the universal ones. Betrayal is one of the universal ones. Um, what it feels like to be to be seen finally, right? Or to be recognized mm-hmm. for, for who you believe you are. I'm, I mean, this is a very small sampling, but when you drill down past underneath the situation, that's that's those are the human experiences we're getting at, right? Awesome. To make us feel these yeah. things. Awesome. Right. Yeah, emotion is just not la- it's not just laughing, crying, getting angry, right. or feeling right. joy. It's what's behind that. Right. right. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pull out a word from our last episode: soul deep, a hyphenate. Because what so, you're describing, Carly, the 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 root of the human experience, those are the soul deep core of our emotional experiences. You know, so. You might be anxious about work, but why? Because if you're afraid you're going to get fired, that's rejection, right? Or that's Mm -hmm. disappointment. I'll disappoint my wife like I disappointed my dad when I was 12 or, you know. And so, yeah, I think if we can, you know, if we're struggling with finding the emotional pull of a scene, it might be useful to step back from it and say what's underneath this. You know, I know these characters feel this way because of X, Y, and Z events or this plot point or this argument or this whatever, but why is this character as a human being having this specific reaction? And is that going to be conveyed to the reader? You know, you might do all of your core wound work and your character development and all of your backstory but you have to find a way for those things to be part of that two plus two that creates this empathetic drive in your reader. Yeah. yeah. And I would say, yeah, go ahead, Robert. There you go. And I would say, be careful not to name it. Right. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. I, think, I think, you, I think you really, you know, if I, if, if in this Cersei moment and she, she feels this, this soul deep rejection, if the author had said, and then the soul deep rejection ripped through her guts, like, no, you know, like that's, 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 I think where we come back to, you know, the, the, you know, the classic showing and not telling, show us, show us and make us feel the rejection. And maybe you, the writer, you, the author, no rejection mm-hmm. is what's at play here. Right. But your reader, if you, if you execute it, your reader will know too. Right. And that's the, <clears throat> excuse me, the layer of subtext that is even below showing. You know, if you've got telling and then yes. showing, and then there's the subtext, which is the unstated, but nevertheless conveyed. Yeah. Ooh, good definition. Thank yeah. You. And, and the, um, you know, we've always done the classic show, don't tell thing. It'd be like Shakespeare coming on stage and saying, no, I just want to pause this here. The reason that King <laughs> Lear is acting this way is because way back, you know, when he was seven, is. You know, and it, it, that's what you risk, isn't it, by both naming the emotion or even then saying, you know, um, Robert had, had had such a hard time with relationships ever since it was 11 and his mum and dad split up, blah, 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 blah. We just don't need to know that. Mm-hmm. You know, you right. don't need to have the authorial stamp coming in because it robs the emotion. It's, as you say, Carly, you don't want to be told it's rejection. You want to feel it. Right. Mm-hmm. Back to the Back to the catcher in the rye, if... Holden Caulfield had told us on page one that he's really broken up about his brother and he's having right. a hard time. I mean, it'd be one page, right? Why or write like, the rest right. of the story? Right. That's it there. Right. There's no right. Then what's the point? What's mm-hmm. the point? You know, my we brother died. I'm it. having a hard time. Right, I'm having a hard time. Life might <laughs> be empty. Bye. The end. You know? Yeah, the end. It's a, so. Catcher in the Rye on Twitter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's the new handle, Robert. You started. Yeah. <laughs> 
goodness. Yeah. Do you know what I think it's even harder to do? Wait, may I add one, one thing? I think it's uh, even harder to do with positive, like with happy emotions and positive emotions, you know? Mm, like, true. what did I name? Rejection, loyal, or, right. um, betrayal, despair. That's a new one. But, but what about, you know, what about joy? What about elation? What about, um, yeah, I think I said feeling seen and feeling like you're recognized for who you are. I mean, how, I, I think even those, um, it takes a lot, you know, like that takes, that takes a lot of soul digging, I think, to, well, what does, the, uh, how are the stakes such that we know when our character has, I mean, I think we do know in the story when our character gets to those, to, gets to that, to that point and would feel that way, but how do you make the reader feel that way? I feel like it mm. might even be tougher with the, with the happy mm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Without sounding Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and reductive. You yes. Know? And I don't think we write... The happy stuff nearly as much as we write the unhappy stuff because even if you look at a happily ever story happily ever after story like a rom-com there's the comedy element so there are always going to be foibles and obstacles or pratfalls or so there are still moments of maybe not tragedy but missteps, embarrassment, um, you know, missed opportunity, maybe even shame if you're going a little darker at some moment. So we still have shades of the negative aspect of the human experience that creates the journey where the happily ever after is such a big payoff. Mm. Right? Because if everything were puppies and daisies, and then you had a big wedding, Where's the story? <laughs> right, right. It's it's unearned at that point, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. The happy ending and the emotions that come with it are, yeah, they're not right. Earned. Right. So even in happy stories, we don't have a story without obstacles to be overcome, however lighthearted they may seem. Sure. This yes. has been our age-old discussion, isn't it? You know, that it, it's not a story unless there's conflict. So. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Indeed. It's it's the one it's the one page catcher in the rye, otherwise. Yeah, that's right. dead and it screwed me. And it screwed me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.